I so don't feel like doing this. The day has arrived where you will finally learn how to integrate using the Lebesgue integral. And after having waded through all of these swamps of uh, strange sets and sigma algebras, you're going to be surprised at how rapidly things are now going to improve, uh, evolve. So, how do we integrate? The outline is we start with simple functions and then we use the approximation argument or from the last theorem of last lecture to just lift that to general functions very much in a similar way like we do for the Riemann integral. So, All right, so if, am I recording? Yes. If f is a simple function, so then it has this form, positive measurable on some space, measurable space x, a, so a is the sigma algebra, x is the set, mu a measure, of course, on x with respect to this sigma algebra, then, the integral of f is going to be the, the sum. k goes from 1 to m c k u of a k. And that shouldn't come as a surprise, right? We've been building up to this. We can visualize it. If we have the Riemann integral um, and a function like this, how do we integrate it? Well, we take, if this is the base one, base two, base three, height one, height two, and height three. Then, and this is called f, then the integral f dx was, uh, is the usual notation for the Riemann integral. It would be d1 h1, let's just do it here, h1 d1 plus h2 d2 plus h3 d3, right? But here, Instead of calling them height, I can call them C1, C2, and C3, and then I get here C1, C2, C3, right? And then instead of writing V1, which is the length of the base here, I can call this interval one, this interval two, and this interval three, and then my formula here will be sum C, K, K goes from one to three, and then the length of IK, where now I use the X notation lambda IK meaning the length of AK. Right? So it's exactly the same idea here. We take the height times the size of the base. The only new thing here is that we are now measure mu, which tells us what is the size. And we are no longer restricted to live on the silly real line, but we can be on any space X that can be anything basically, right? So as long as we can measure sizes of sets down on X, height is still just the height. So height times the size of the base. This is the idea of uh, area or volume or how you want to visualize it. So, before, when we did the Riemann integral, there was no need to write here. I mean, dx, it's a stupid notation. It comes from us. We usually call this, you know, the x axis. And then you integrate against x. And, you know, we can have other variables here. And then you call it that variable. But it, it depends what, what you write here. The, the something depends on what you call the variable on your real axis. Here, in the Lebesgue integral, we give it the name of the measure. So here, if I write the same integral of the u, it's just that I'm calling the x, the, the, the variable down here on the real line for u, but it's still the same integral. 
Here I can have one measure mu and another measure nu. An integral f the mu or the nu would be two different things or two different values. It's the same Lebesgue integral, but with different measures, a different outcome. Here, of course, the same outcome. It's just one Riemann integral. There are many of these guys. Okay, so then we can integrate simple functions, but that's not very satisfactory. We want to get to any measurable function. And that's when you need to remember the theorem from last lecture, the last one, which says that anytime you have a positive or non-negative measurable function, you can write it as a limit of uh, an increasing sequence of simple functions. So this is one, two, if f so oh, to lift this construction to just any measurable function f we just take a supremum of the integral of all the simple functions which are below f and I didn't write here measurable because it gets tiresome to write everything in this course is going to be measurable from now on so functions we just assume them to be measurable if, unless otherwise stated. So natural definition it's the same idea like in the Riemann. In the Riemann what did we do we had this function and then we looked at uh, piecewise continuous functions below it. And then we took the supremum of all such functions. And that was the integral value, given that the corresponding infimum of piecewise constant functions being above gave the same value. So that's a clear difference with the Riemann integral and this. Here we just work with the supremum. We don't care about the infimum. So the integral always exists. And as long as a function is non negative and measurable, the integral will exist. So, for example, um, well, actually, that's already here. So, the integral we were struggling with, with here, with, with the Riemann integral, we couldn't even integrate from zero to one the rational numbers. That's where I started out my introduction lecture telling you about that, yeah, but this should be given some value and preferably zero because there are just countably many points. Um, but if you use this definition that you need to go from below and above, you get stuck with zero on the supremum from below, you get stuck with one from the infimum from above on the integral from zero to one. Here, if I work, I mean, here I implicitly, if nothing else is written, we are integrating over the whole real line, right? Sometimes you put the set here x, if you want to be over and clear. If we integrate over the whole real line, we still get zero because the height here is one and the size of the set is zero, so we get zero very easy. So this is very nice with the Lebesgue integral that once something is measurable, you don't need to worry about integrability as long as it's non-negative. How do we deal with just general functions? Oh, also worth it to point out, we allow the value infinity. Now for functions which are both, positive and negative, we remove infinity. You could also include infinity, but that, that gets, uh, it's, it's not worth it, right? So now we go for option three. Okay, to integrate f the new for any measurable function with real values, we just take the non-negative part, integrate that, it gives us a positive number. You take the negative part, or non-positive, if you want, and integrate that, it gives you again the positive number, so we subtract that. So let's let's just remember that now this is horrible disposition of the blackboard, pedagogical prices, not to me, somebody else. Um, so anyways, this is the idea, right? We compose a function into a non-negative 
I call them positive and negative, right? So a positive part and a negative part. And the idea is here that this F plus is equal to the maximum of F and zero. And F minus is equal to the maximum of minus F and zero. So, uh, yeah. Then we see that we get this. And by the theorem, the first theorem of, no, the second theorem of last lecture, we know that, you know, if F is measurable, then F plus is going to be a measurable function, same with F minus. Okay, so I write here, given that at least one is finite, so if you have two finite numbers, you take the difference, well, that, that, that's the value of your integral, it's well defined. Um, if one of them is infinite, then I get infinite minus some finite number, we still call that infinite. Same if this one is infinite, then the integral value is minus infinity. But if you get infinity minus infinity, then this simply doesn't exist, yeah? And here there is an annoying thing with the terminology of the book. So when both are finite, we say that F is integrable. If one of them is finite, then the integral exists, but the function is not integrable. I don't like this notation, but as long as you're aware of this fine difference, then um, you know, then it's fine. You just need to be aware of it, otherwise we'll get confused. And the set of integrable functions, we're going to show in a little while that that's a vector space. Actually, it's a Banach space. No, it's not, but it's a norm. Well, anyway, it has more properties. But you can consider now the collection of all functions which are integrable, and that has also its own notation. So adding up to my pedagogical price that I will never get, I write here L1, X, A, U, and sometimes it put in also R, because we could have functions which are complex values. We'll get to that shortly. So this is the space or the set of all functions which are integrable, meaning both these two are finite. Okay, so we can, uh, once you have a definition of something, you know how to start to list properties. So a few properties are like immediate. Yeah, for example, that if G is less than F, both are measurable, we assume that implicitly then the integral of G is less than the integral of F, of course, because, well, at least in the non-negative case, uh, G is a supremum, I'm sorry, the integral of G is a supremum, and all functions that are involved with that supremum are also below F, so the corresponding supremum here is taking over a larger set of simple functions, so that the supremum should be higher. Um, yeah, or functions, real value functions also with the negative part, you just do this for the positive and the negative part separately and then you add up and you realize that this. Uh, another thing we get immediately from the definition, if I multiply with a constant, then I can move that out. Well, it's pretty immediate anyways. This holds for simple functions and You have to look at the supremum and see that maybe this supremum is less than that supremum and that supremum is less than this supremum. But anyway, it's a very short argument. Um, but once we get to more difficult statements, uh, the book gets very lengthy. So now we want stuff like integral f plus g d mu equal to integral f d mu plus integral g. U. And here it's not really clear how to go on about it with these supremums. Um, because the integral here is the supremum of a collection of simple functions that take corresponding integrals. And you could consider the same collection for this guy, but then how do you relate it to this one? Um, 
it gets messy. And here is actually one point where I do not really like uh, the exposition in the book. So I, I love this book for the way it's very exact to the point, well thought through. But I think here in the second chapter, section 2.3, he makes a bit of unnecessary detour. So I'm going to get, um, because what he does is he starts to prove these things first for simple functions, and then he, he lifts it up to, to more and more generality through a sequence of lemmas and propositions. I don't like to do that. But there is a faster way. And that is to go immediately for what's called the monotone convergence theory, even without establishing any of that. And once you have the monotone convergence theory, uh, you can get back and prove these things. So <clears throat> looking ahead, the three main theories that we'll do in this class, which are like the foundation, the most important theories in this course, I would say, alongside with a few others. That's dominated convergence theory, monotone convergence theory, and the third one with a peculiar name, Fatou's lemma. And that's a lemma that you never know when to apply it unless somebody tells you that, hey, you should use Fatou's lemma, and then it usually does miracles. It's a very kind of strange statement. So the layout, the lineup, whatever, for today is we do monotone convergence theory first, and we do these kind of statements, and then we do Fatou's lemma and dominated convergence theory, and then maybe something else, depending on how long time that takes. So, given a non-decreasing sequence of functions, that's just redundant for the row here, f1 bigger than, smaller than or equal to f2, smaller than or equal to so on, on x into the extended positive real line, we have the limit as k goes to infinity of the integrals of these respective functions is the same as if we now take the limit on the inside, and this gives us a new function f. So first of all, we assume that these guys are all measurable. So is this one measurable? Yes. Due to theorem two, the main theorem of last lecture, that was one of the things. We're allowed to take limits, and we don't lose measurability. Sometimes the limit doesn't exist, and then we have to you know, just omit those points, and then it's still true that this guy is measurable where the limit exists, and that's a measurable set. But here we don't have this problem because this is a non-decreasing sequence of functions, so the limit will exist at all points. So this is a measurable function on x. And this is a beautiful result. So integration is in a way a limit process in itself, right? It's a supremum, so you can think of it as a limit. Or rather, you can think of a limit as a supremum, if you want to be correct. Supremum is more general. But so when can you flip the order of lim limits? This is the fundamental question of analysis most of the time. Um, or a key question in analysis, at least. And it's, this is where I started my introductory lecture that one of the major flaws of the Riemann integral is precisely this, that we are not allowed to do this. We are not even sure if we can integrate the guy on the other side. And look here how easily it follows. I mean, measurability of him, then the integral exists. So we don't even need to worry about you know, existence uh, of the integral. And yeah, this is always true. You know, there's no stupid condition you have to check, nothing. So this is beautiful. Well, catch. If you work with negative, Functions with negative values. Uh, 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 uh. That's why there's this Fatou lemma and the dominated convergence theory, because that's a different story. But for non-negative functions, it, it 
couldn't be better than this. Okay, so how are we going to prove this kind of stuff? We're going to pair up the monotone convergence theory with theory in three from last lecture, which says that you can always, if you start with a measurable function f, you can always write it as the limit in this way of simple measurable functions, which is non decreasing sequence. So those two combined allows us to go from just the integral of whatever down to simple functions and then do whatever we need to do, split up into something. We want mostly the simple functions, everything is easy. And then you go back through the limits. So that's the, the grand master plan. Okay, how do we prove the monotone convergence theory? Of course, now we're not allowed to use any of this stuff, right? So one has to be careful here. We can only work with the, the definition we have of the integral and whatever we know of measurable functions. Okay, so before we get to the proof, let me just point out a few things I'm skipping here. So, if this, I mean, this is the definition of how we integrate a simple function. But what if a simple function, I mean, it can be expressed in many different ways, right? We can have different subsets, a, k, and coefficient ck that together sum up to become the same function. Does it give us the same value? Yes, it does. It's extremely boring to check. I'm just skipping that. Then once we do number two here, we define the integral of f as a supremum of simple functions. But if f is then simple, now we have two contradictory definitions, right? We have this definition of the, as the supremum, and then you have this guy. Does it give the same number? Yes, it does. It's also damn boring to check. I'm just skipping that, okay? Right, so not the proof. So as usual, we want to establish an equality, we establish two inequalities. One of them is often easy and the other one is hard. So let's start with the easy one. And then you remember what I said up here, if a function is smaller than another one, uh, the corresponding integrals are smaller in the same order, right? So let's give this guy here a name. Let's call him F. So each FK is smaller than F, yeah? Meaning that the integral FK is smaller than or equal to the integral of F, yes? And if that is true for all Ks, I can also put a limit here. And I still preserve this inequality, right? The limit, if, if the, I mean, this is a fixed number, it doesn't move. So if it's bigger than all of these numbers, it's also going to be bigger than or equal to uh, the limit. So this is the easy direction. So to do the hard direction, I'm going to give this a name. So now I want to prove that alpha is bigger than or equal to into a f. Yeah, but this the moment of the theory has been established. Okay, so we think of this in terms of just like Riemann functions. So x is just going to look like the real line. F is this guy here. And this fellow here, I'm going to call him S. Give that a different color. So now, Remember that the integral of f mu is equal to so by what I recently said about the integral of s being the same as that sum, the integral of f is the supremum of all simple functions s less than or equal to f like this, right? So if I have a concrete simple function S, yeah, we fix it now. 
And then you have to imagine that, okay, then comes these guys FK here. Yes, F1, F2 gets a bit closer and so on. If I could prove that, you know, if I just go far enough on the sub index K here, then I'm above this guy F, S, sorry, S, then I'm done, right? Because then I have that one of these integrals are gonna be bigger than the integral of S where S is fixed, meaning that this limit here is gonna be bigger than S, the integral of S. And then since S was arbitrary, I take a supremum. And again, I see that this holds like that. Point is, I cannot get above S with any of these F1, F2, doesn't matter how high I put my K because the corners here meet, right? This guy S here at this point, it's the same as F. So it could be that the, all the F Ks are below the value of S at that point. So I'm gonna do a clever trick. I'm gonna push down the function S just a little bit by multiplying it with a number I'm gonna call it C, which is just any number less than one. And then at the end of the day, I'm gonna say that for S, C is any number less than one, so I can let it be arbitrarily close to one. So that's the trick. I'm gonna squeeze S down a bit so that, you know, it's gonna be this guy. It's gonna be C S, which is a bit below, and then I can always find some red guy that goes on top of it. That's the plan. Okay, so let's see the number less than one arbitrary. S, an arbitrary guy from the supremum here is simple, so it has this form less than or equal to F, and both of them are fixed. C is fixed, S is fixed. Okay, and then I introduce the set EK, which is a set of points X where FK of X is bigger than CS of X. So, you know, if you look at um, this guy F1 here, it goes about the purple guy here. So then it will be this piece will be F1. Then it sits below here, it goes above again, but not there. So, okay, then like this piece down here would also be in my um, E1, sorry. So this would be like the E1 set, right? If this is my F1. So now we know here two important things about the E case. EK increases with K in a set notion sense like so each time K goes up, the set becomes bigger than or equal to the previous set. Set inclusion. Okay, and the infinite union of all the EKs is equal to X. This is very important. If we didn't have this constant C to push down this guy, we would not have this property. But now we know that CS of X at every point is less than f of x. And the limit of these guys is f of x. So therefore, the limit for some value k big enough, it goes above this number. Yeah? So these two things are very important, especially this last guy here. OK, so I have to leave at the right on the lower half here of this. but. That's fine. Okay, now comes the beauty of this argument. So the integral of fk, the mu, is bigger than or equal to integral fk times the characteristic function of ek, the mu. Clearly, because this guy is either one or zero, so this is a smaller function than this function. Now, 
inside of EK, I know that my FK is bigger than CS. So I can throw away FK and replace it with CS, still making the integral smaller. Now, finally, this is a characteristic function, right? Sorry, this is a simple function. So I can use that summation formula for the integral. So we get I wasn't bad that I did. So here the index can no longer be k because k is already used something else is this k here. So I write now this function s as a sum of cj times characteristic aj. But then multiplying with this guy outside would be the same as just taking the section of the set aj with ek on the inside. Easy to see, just think that through, maybe pause the video, say, ah, uh -huh, it's like that. And this coefficient c in front, it just goes on the inside, okay? Now that I have it like this, I use the summation formula. So this is equal to sum k from one to n c c j mu of a j intersect e k. And now we're interested in taking the limit here as k goes to infinity. So let's do that. Limits respect inequalities. So limit of this is bigger than or equal to limit of this. And here, this is a finite sum. So I can move the limit on the inside. But then proposition 1.2.3, which is one of the most used propositions in this book. Sorry, 1.2.5. was 1.2.3 in the previous version. Tells us, so what do we have here? Uh, you know, for fixed J, this is increasing. Every time K goes up, it gets bigger. The union the infinite union of all the EKs is X, meaning that the infinite union here is just going to be my AJ. First, we switch order limit and sum, and then we use proposition 1.2.5 to take the limit from the outside into an infinite union on the inside. But now, as I said, this infinite union is X. So at the end of the day, what we have here is, and the C I can move to the outside, So we get on the right hand side the integral of cs in u. Okay, so what we have here, this was what we decided to call alpha. And I want to prove that it's bigger than or equal to f. What I have here is that alpha is bigger than or equal to integral of cs the mu. For all C less than one and for all S less than or equal to F, simple. Okay, now we take a supremum of all C's. Well, yeah, C inside or outside doesn't matter. Take the supremum of all C's, or you can take it away. Now you take the supremum over all S's and you actually get your integral F. So, by the definition. And uh, yeah, that's how the monotone convergence theory can be proven. As I said in the book, they do it in a different way or not it's something along these lines, but for some reason it does it much later. But if we start out with this, now we can easily get all those summation formulas and whatnot using this and the last theory in theorem uh, three from last lecture. So yeah, I'll erase the blackboard and then we get to it.
All right, so watch and learn. So now how we get all the things easily theory. If F and G are non-negative, then integral F plus G, the mu is equal to integral F, the mu plus integral G, the mu. Also, if F and G are integrable, remember that means that the positive and negative part of F and G are a finite integral, right? Then the same formula holds. Okay, how do we prove this now? Uh, the second part is easy. I'm just gonna omit that. You just, once you have this, you know, apply this statement to the positive part and negative part separately. Uh, No, it's not that simple. Anyways, it's it's boring. So we skip that. How do we get here? This is the difficult thing. Well, theory in three from last time tells us that we can approximate F and G by a sequence of non-decreasing simple functions, which I'm going to call FK and GK. Just what I said, F limit FK, same with the G limit GK. Now, clearly, this happens at every point. You know, this is pointwise. Yeah? So this is just a result from analysis one, or if you want, the yeah, limit of the sum of two sequences is the limit of the first sequence times the limit of the second sequence. So this is obvious or a, a, a theory from analysis, you know, basic calculus, basic analysis. It is analysis and calculus are more or less the same. It is. Probably this is, sequences is probably more analysis than calculus, but I'm not really sure. Anyway, so integral F plus G the mu is equal to limit as k goes to infinity integral f k plus g k the mu, right? And what do we use here? We use the monotone convergence theory, MCT. Now, each one of these is a simple function, so finite sum of some values and then characteristic functions of sets. Same with this guy. That for these type of, for simple functions, then you can split it up and write you can write this instead that's uh, probably something tedious to show that but, but it's, it's not difficult that's almost immediate okay and the limit here I didn't do anything with it but now I'm seeing this is just the limit of one sequence of numbers and another sequence of numbers so analysis basic analysis again And sometimes when there are many limits, I just don't feel like writing. K goes to infinity, so I just write limit because it's obvious what sort of limit I'm talking about. And now, again, monotone convergence theorem on this guy it says this is the integral of f. Same, this will be the integral of g. So there you go. Easy and smooth. Two lines, three. Okay, what can we do with the monotone convergence theory? Well, first of all, we can finally invent a multitude of measures, at least on the real line, that we didn't have so far. We we're dealing with one measure, right? The Lebesgue measure. Monotone convergence theory allows us to introduce new measures in the following way. So, uh, example, pick. F in L1 are 
might say it should be more measurable, just to exercise this new notation a bit. Uh, and okay, real value. Oh, sorry. That's implicit. When nothing else is written, it's always real value, but let's have this um, lambda here. Okay, and well, okay, then I'm, I'm gonna have to also assume that it's positive. So, this is just a different way of saying, like, f be a measurable function, non negative, which is integrable. Uh, okay, but then we can define a measure of. I'm getting tired now. Right, so this is one example, um, or a more general, uh, more generality, f could also be in some L1, x, a, mu. And if we have this mu, we can use this mu to cook up new measures that I'm going to call new. Okay, so. Yeah, let's just work in the latter setting, yeah, because this is a special case. So define mu of a to be equal to integral over a f the mu. Now here's something we haven't defined yet. I haven't introduced what I mean by this. I said sometimes we put here x just to be over clear, but you can also put other sets there. And that what we mean by that by definition is integrating f against the characteristic function of a the mu. So this is just a short-term notation for this. Okay. Now the proposition here, if you want, is that mu of a or mu rather is a function on the sigma algebra, and that defines a new measure. So in particular here, any integrable function positive on the real line gives us a new uh, measure, which connects, for example, very much with probability theory. So if f now is a Gaussian, yeah, then we think of it as a probability density function. So the probability then that x is in this interval, you get by integrating this guy. And we can think of this now, instead of integrating against f, we just take the measure that's defined by f via the Lebesgue measure of this set here, and that gives us then the probability. Okay. Right. So proof of this fact would be all right. So mu, sorry, mu of the void set is integral over the void set. F the mu when well, that's zero, because well, it's the same as multiplying with the characteristic function of the void set as identically zero. So that was easy. Uh, okay. Now the difficult one is that if a1, a2, and so on are disjoint in A, so remember now. What is the definition of being a measure? It is the following formula that mu of the infinite union of the A case should be the same as the infinite sum of mu applied to the A case. So let's see if we can get there. So this is now, let me skip one step so I write immediately like this. This is the same as yes and monotone convergence theory well what is this I can write here big K and then limit as big K goes to infinity yeah, and the monotone convergence, I mean, this increases as k gets bigger, right? So the monotone convergence theory tells me I can put him outside. Uh, 
And then, of course, once I have a finite sum, I can also put him on the outside. And this is the same as the sum from one to infinity. By definition, these two combined is this. And here on the inside, I have new of a k, which was to be proven. Good. Maybe you feel that in this step here, it was not this, never necessary to use just characteristic functions. I didn't really use that from here to here, yes. But from here to go here and then here, uh, you know, well, to move this infinite sum from the inside to the outside, that was just monotone convergence theory. And here I could have had any non negative functions. So that's um, like a twist. It's actually equivalent with the monotone convergence theory in that you can still work with infinite sums, but it's called Beppo Levi's theory for historical reasons. So let's write that out as a separate thing. Beppo Levi, if f k k one two three four five, take it down to zero, measure of the yada yada, then sum k go to one to infinity, integral f k mu is the same as integral sum k go to one to infinity f k the mu. Yeah. Okay, so that was a, a little bit detour. Getting back to this new measure here, it's stupid to have a new measure if you don't know how to integrate. So if we now invent some other function g, what would be the integral now of g? The new, sorry, the new. Well, oh, so if g is a simple function, right? Well, let's take a characteristic function. And this is mu of a, which is equal to the integral f the mu over a, which is equal to the integral characteristic function of a times f the mu. So now we kind of see a formula here, right? So we can guess that this should also be true. Is that so? Yes, because once something is true for characteristic functions, you can always do finite linear combinations. So then it's true for simple functions. And now, how do we prove something like this? The same like I've been using this whole class. Theory three from last class tells me that I can uh, approximate G with an infinite sequence of simple functions. So this is equal to the sort of corresponding limit of G case, let's call it. This identity is true for all of those G case. And then I use monotone convergence theorem on this side to, to get this in the limit, yeah? I'm tired, I'm not gonna even write that down. So this follows easily. Exercise, to write down the details for yourself. So I'll write just right here, follows easily from monotone convergence theory. All right, I had enough of waiting for this to dry out. Uh, so I was just talking about if a function or rather its modulus is zero almost everywhere, then why is the integral zero? A more general version of that is that if two functions are equal, except, that, you know, if they're equal almost everywhere, meaning that the sets where they're not equal, the set, not the sets, the set where they're not equal has measure zero, then the integrals are the same. So. Uh, proposition if f is equal to g mu almost everywhere then integral f the mu is equal to integral g the mu and proof uh, and as usual i'll just do the proof for f and g non-negative because then the General case is usually easy to just establish by some simple argument. Um, and here we're going to do the same trick again with this. So, so the beautiful thing with the Lebesgue integral is like we don't define it as the limit of some sequence of increasing functions that we get from theorem three last time. We we define it as a supremum, and then we get that it, 
the limit is the same thing by the monotone convergence theory. But if we, it's tempting, like from a student, when I remember when I was a student, like what we used to think of it as that limit. But then you get into question like, yeah, but if I take a different sequence, will I get the same limit and blah, blah, blah? No, you define it as a supremum and then the monotone convergence theorem tells you that as long as you take a non-decreasing sequence, it doesn't matter which one, uh, if the limit is F, you can, you know, flip border between integration and limit. Okay, so we're gonna do that uh, here again. And we're gonna work with a set, let's call it A, where they are equal, such that the complement of A has measure zero. Such that ST such that A B such that F of X is equal to G of X for all X in A. Am I still on the blackboard? Yeah, barely. Um, and mu of the complement of A is equal to zero. Okay. I have to think for a while. I'm not sure if this is the shortest possible proof. Maybe I'm just tired and not seeing some better proof. But anyways, here's what I will do. So then uh, take F1 less than or equal to F2 less than or equal to the yada, yada simple such that uh, integral F the mu is equal to the limit k goes to infinity integral F k the mu. Then integral F Characteristic of A in U is also equal to the corresponding limit, right? Yeah. And once you have simple functions, remember now we can go to the formula. This is a, for each k, this is a finite sum of the measure of you know the sets a k whatever that gives this guy. And now when we multiply with a characteristic function, that's like taking an intersection. And since the, the complement of this set has measure zero, you know, we, we don't alter the size of the sets in the simple function here. So for simple functions, it's easy to see that we can throw away this characteristic function. Yeah, and then we're back to, okay. So we have this. Now, of course, since F and G are the same on A, I can also say that, well, this is equal to integral G characteristic function of A the mu. And now, by repeating this argument with some other sequence, GK, of course, uh, mutatis mutandis, we have this. Okay, and then we see that this guy is equal to that guy for non negative functions, and then we do some yada yada bar to lift it up to the integrable case. Good. So, in particular, if the modulus of a function is zero almost everywhere, then the integral is zero. Not almost everywhere. The integral is just a number, so it is zero. Uh, and now we're going to look at the um, converse to that statement, namely, so if you integrate the modulus of a function and you get zero, it means that the function itself is zero, new almost everywhere. It doesn't need to be zero everywhere. Just think of the, you know, the characteristic function of the rational numbers. Then the integral here will give you zero, but the function f is actually non-zero very often on every rational numbers that tends. But uh, yeah, as we've discussed many times, there are few rational numbers comparatively. So still, that's a function which is zero almost everywhere. 
So don't be fooled by thinking that, oh, it's just a few points. No, 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 there's zero almost everywhere. It can still mean that you have a lot of other values. Okay, how do we do about this proof? I just write what's written on my paper because I don't feel like thinking. So given epsilon bigger than zero, set EN to be equal to the points where the modulus of this is bigger than one over N. Okay, what can we possibly do with this? So then zero is equal to the integral of modulus f of x the mu. I'm allowed to write my parenthesis x if I want to express that. Notation here is a bit flexible. Okay, and that's bigger than or equal to integral f of x characteristic function of en the mu. Aha, now I see where this is going. Of course, that means that this is still zero, but now I know that on this set the function is bigger than one over n. So Okay, this is just the simplest form of simple function that just have one value. So this is one over n times mu of e n, which does have measure zero. And that's the nice thing here, the n can be very big, but still this is a finite number. So the only way to make it zero is if this is really zero. Now, all the points, where f of x is non zero in modulus is the union of the ENs. Okay, so this is an increasing sequence of sets that has measure zero. Then the intimate union also has measure zero. This is a proposition 1.2.5. Better learn, remember that right away. Good. Last peculiar, uh, or not peculiar, but last statement, which is nice, but not very deep or anything, is um, coming in the end of this blackboard. <coughs> and it's a bit the other way around. If the integral is finite, then the function must be finite almost everywhere. So if the f is integrable, then the modulus f of x, well, f of x is a real value or a complex value almost everywhere. Okay, proof. Now we just do it for the non-negative ones, because yeah, by the same yada yada. Set. This one runs a bit differently. Now we want E to be the set of points where f of x is equal to infinity. So this is the set you want to prove that it has measure zero. Do you see that still? Right. So if the function is infinite at the points in E, then any finite number n is less than infinity. So this num function here, n times characteristic, the function of E is going to be below f. So I use this inequality here uh, that we used many times so far, and I get n times mu of e being less than this value. Now, if this is a finite number, this is true for all n. That can only happen if this number here is zero. Okay, so good. So while editing this, I realized that this lecture is just getting insanely long. I had announced that I would do the three main theory in dominated monotone and plateaus, but let's cut it here, call it a day. So what we did, this entire section 2.3, 2.4.1, which is monotone convergence theory. So for next time, we we'll leave plateaus lemma dominate the convergence theorem and we're also going to do the Riemann integral like put that in a proper connection with the Lebesgue integral 
Uh, and that's it for chapter two. Then we move into the exciting and exotic topics of chapter three. Ciao.